anti-Semitism in Britain. There are about 400,000 known Jews in Britain, in addition to some thousands or at most scores of thousands of Jewish refugees who have entered the country from 1934 onwards. The Jewish population is almost entirely concentrated in half a dozen big towns and is mostly employed in the food, clothing and furniture trades. A few of the big monopolies, such as the ICI, one or two leading newspapers and at least one big chain of department stores are Jewish-owned or partly Jewish-owned, but it would be very far from the truth to say that British business life is dominated by Jews. The Jews seem, on the contrary, to have failed to keep up with the modern tendency towards big amalgamations, and to have remained fixed in those trades which are necessarily carried out on a small scale and by old-fashioned methods. I start off with these background facts, which are already known to any well-informed person, in order to emphasize that there is no real Jewish problem in England. The Jews are not numerous or powerful enough, and it is only in what are loosely called intellectual circles that they have any noticeable influence. Yet it is generally admitted that anti-Semitism is on the increase, that it has been greatly exacerbated by the war, and that humane and enlightened people are not immune to it. It does not take violent forms, English people are almost invariably gentle and law-abiding, but it is ill-natured enough, and in favourable circumstances it could have political results. Here are some examples of anti-Semitic remarks that have been made to me during the past year or two. Middle-aged office employee. I generally come to work by bus. It takes longer, but I don't care about using the underground from Golders Green nowadays. There's too many of the chosen race travelling on that line. Tobacconist. Woman. No, I've got no matches for you. I should try the lady down the street. She's always got matches. One of the chosen race, you see. Young intellectual. Communist or neo-communist. No, I do not like Jews. I've never made any secret of that. I can't stick them. Mind you, I'm not anti-Semitic, of course. Middle-class woman. Well, no one could call me anti-Semitic, but I do think the way these Jews behave is too absolutely stinking. The way they push their way to the head of queues and so on. They're so abominably selfish. I think they're responsible for a lot of what happens to them. Milk roundsman. A Jew don't do no work. Not the same as what an Englishman does. He's too clever. We work with this ear. Flexes his biceps. They work with that there. Taps his forehead. Chartered accountant. Intelligent. Left wing in an undirected way. These bloody yids are all pro-German. They change sides tomorrow if the Nazis got here. I see a lot of them in my business. They admire Hitler at the bottom of their hearts. They'll always suck up to anyone who kicks them. Intelligent woman on being offered a book dealing with anti-Semitism and German atrocities. Don't show it to me. Please don't show it to me. It'll only make me hate the Jews more than ever. I could fill pages with similar remarks, but these will do to go on with. Two facts emerge from them. One, which is very important and which I must return to in a moment, is that above a certain intellectual level, people are ashamed of being anti-Semitic and are careful to draw a distinction between anti-Semitism and disliking Jews. The other is that anti-Semitism is an irrational thing. The Jews are accused of specific offences, for instance bad behaviour in food queues, which the person speaking feels strongly about, but it is obvious that these accusations merely rationalise some deep-rooted prejudice. To attempt to counter them with facts and statistics is useless, and may sometimes be worse than useless. As the last of the above-quoted remark shows, people can remain anti-Semitic, or at least anti-Jewish, while being fully aware that their outlook is indefensible. If you dislike somebody, you dislike him, and there is an end of it. Your feelings are not made any better by a recital of his virtues. It so happens that the war has encouraged the growth of anti-Semitism, and even, in the eyes of many ordinary people, given some justification for it. To begin with, the Jews are one people of whom it can be said with complete certainty that they will benefit by an Allied victory. Consequently, the theory that this is a Jewish war has a certain plausibility, all the more so because the Jewish war effort seldom gets its fair share of recognition. The British Empire is a huge, heterogeneous organisation held together largely by mutual consent, and it is often necessary to flatter the less reliable elements at the expense of the more loyal ones. To publicise the exploits of Jewish soldiers, or even to admit the existence of a considerable Jewish army in the Middle East, rouses hostility in South Africa, the Arab countries and elsewhere. 
It is easier to ignore the whole subject and allow the man in the street to go on thinking that Jews are exceptionally clever at dodging military service. Then again, Jews are to be found in exactly those trades which are bound to incur unpopularity with the civilian public in wartime. Jews are mostly concerned with selling food, clothes, furniture and tobacco, exactly the commodities of which there is a chronic shortage, with consequent overcharging, black marketing and favoritism. And again, the common charge that Jews behave in an exceptionally cowardly way during air raids was given a certain amount of colour by the big raids of 1940. As it happened, the Jewish quarter of Whitechapel was one of the first areas to be heavily blitzed, with the natural result that swarms of Jewish refugees distributed themselves all over London. If one judged merely from these wartime phenomena, it would be easy to imagine that anti-Semitism is a quasi-rational thing, founded on mistaken premises. And naturally, the anti-Semite thinks of himself as a reasonable being. Whenever I have touched on this subject in a newspaper article, I have always had a considerable comeback, and invariably some of the letters are from well-balanced, middling people, doctors, for example, with no apparent economic grievance. These people always say, as Hitler says in Mein Kampf, that they started out with no anti-Jewish prejudice, but were driven into their present position by mere observation of the facts. Yet one of the marks of anti-Semitism is an ability to believe stories that could not possibly be true. One could see a good example of this in the strange accident that occurred in London in 1942, when a crowd, frightened by a bomb burst nearby, fled into the mouth of an underground station, with the result that something over a hundred people were crushed to death. The very same day it was repeated all over London that the Jews were responsible. Clearly, if people will believe this kind of thing, one will not get much further by arguing with them. The only useful approach is to discover why they can swallow absurdities on one particular subject while remaining sane on others. But now let me come back to that point I mentioned earlier, that there is widespread awareness of the prevalence of anti-Semitic feeling and unwillingness to admit sharing it. Among educated people, anti-Semitism is held to be an unforgivable sin and in a quite different category from other kinds of racial prejudice. People will go to remarkable lengths to demonstrate that they are not anti-Semitic, Thus, in 1943, an intercession service on behalf of the Polish Jews was held in a synagogue in St. John's Wood. The local authorities declared themselves anxious to participate in it, and the service was attended by the mayor of the borough in his robes and chain, by representatives of all the churches, and by detachments of RAF, home guards, nurses, boy scouts, and whatnot. On the surface, it was a touching demonstration of solidarity with the suffering Jews, but it was essentially a conscious effort to behave decently by people whose subjective feelings must in many cases have been very different. That quarter of London is partly Jewish, anti-Semitism is rife there, and, as I well knew, some of the men sitting round me in the synagogue were tinged by it. Indeed, the commander of my own platoon of home guards, who had been especially keen beforehand that we should make a good show at the intercession service, was an ex-member of Mosley's Black Shirts. While this division of feeling exists, Tolerance of mass violence against Jews, or, what is more important, anti-Semitic legislation, are not possible in England. It is not at present possible, indeed, that anti-Semitism should become respectable, but this is less of an advantage than it might appear. One effect of the persecutions in Germany has been to prevent anti-Semitism from being seriously studied. In England, a brief inadequate survey was made by mass observation a year or two ago, but if there has been any other investigation of the subject, then its findings have been kept strictly secret. At the same time, there has been conscious suppression, by all thoughtful people, of anything likely to wound Jewish susceptibilities. After 1934, the Jew joke disappeared as though by magic from postcards, periodicals, and the music hall stage, and to put an unsympathetic Jewish character into a novel or short story came to be regarded as anti-Semitism. On the Palestine issue, too, it was de rigueur among enlightened people to accept the Jewish case as proved and avoid examining the claims of the Arabs, a decision which might be correct on its own merits, but which was adopted primarily because the Jews were in trouble and it was felt that one must not criticize them. Thanks to Hitler, therefore, you had a situation in which the press was in effect censored in favor of the Jews, while in private anti-Semitism was on the upgrade even to some extent among sensitive and intelligent people. This was particularly noticeable in 1940 at the time of the internment of the refugees. Naturally, every thinking person felt that it was his duty to protest against the wholesale locking up of unfortunate foreigners who, for the most part, were only in England because they were opponents of Hitler. 
Privately, however, one heard very different sentiments expressed. A minority of the refugees behaved in an exceedingly tactless way, and the feeling against them necessarily had an anti-Semitic undercurrent, since they were largely Jews. A very eminent figure in the Labour Party, I won't name him, but he is one of the most respected people in England, said to me quite violently, We never asked these people to come to this country. If they chose to come here, let them take the consequences. Yet this man would, as a matter of course, have associated himself with any kind of petition or manifesto against the internment of aliens. This feeling that anti-Semitism is something sinful and disgraceful, something that a civilized person does not suffer from, is unfavorable to a scientific approach, and indeed many people will admit that they are frightened of probing too deeply into the subject. They are frightened, that is to say, of discovering not only that anti-Semitism is spreading, but that they themselves are infected by it. To see this in perspective, one must look back a few decades, to the days when Hitler was an out-of-work house painter whom nobody had heard of. One would then find that though anti-Semitism is sufficiently in evidence now, it is probably less prevalent in England than it was 30 years ago. It is true that anti-Semitism as a fully thought-out racial or religious doctrine has never flourished in England. There has never been much feeling against intermarriage, or against Jews taking a prominent part in public life. Nevertheless, 30 years ago it was accepted, more or less, as a law of nature, that a Jew was a figure of fun and, though superior in intelligence, slightly deficient in character. In theory, a Jew suffered from no legal disabilities, but in effect he was debarred from certain professions. He would probably not have been accepted as an officer in the navy, for instance, nor in what is called a smart regiment in the army. A Jewish boy at a public school almost invariably had a bad time. He could, of course, live down his Jewishness if he was exceptionally charming or athletic, but it was an initial disability comparable to a stammer or a birthmark. Wealthy Jews tended to disguise themselves under aristocratic English or Scottish names, and to the average person it seemed quite natural that they should do this, just as it seems natural for a criminal to change his identity, if possible. About 20 years ago in Rangoon, I was getting into a taxi with a friend when a small ragged boy of a fair complexion rushed up to us and began a complicated story about having arrived from Colombo on a ship and wanting money to get back. His manner and appearance were difficult to place, and I said to him, You speak very good English. What nationality are you? He answered eagerly in his chee accent, I am a Jew, sir. And I remember turning to my companion and saying, only partly in joke, he admits it openly. All the Jews I had known till then were people who were ashamed of being Jews, or at any rate preferred not to talk about their ancestry, and if forced to do so, tended to use the word Hebrew. The working class attitude was no better. The Jew who grew up in Whitechapel took it for granted that he would be assaulted, or at least hooted at, if he ventured into one of the Christian slums nearby and the Jew joke of the music halls and the comic papers was almost consistently ill-natured. Note. It is interesting to compare the Jew joke with that other standby of the music halls, the Scotch joke, which superficially it resembles. Occasionally a story is told, e.g. the Jew and the Scotsman who went into a pub together and both died of thirst, which puts races on an equality. But in general, the Jew is credited merely with cunning and avarice, while the Scotsman is credited with physical hardihood as well, this is seen, for example, in the story of the Jew and the Scotsman who go together to a meeting which has been advertised as free. Unexpectedly, there is a collection, and to avoid this, the Jew faints, and the Scotsman carries him out. Here, the Scotsman performs the athletic feat of carrying the other. It would seem vaguely wrong if it were the other way about. End note. There was also literary Jew baiting, which in the hands of Belloc, Chesterton, and their followers reached an almost continental level of scurrility. Non-Catholic writers were sometimes guilty of the same thing in a milder form. There has been a perceptible anti-Semitic strain in English literature from Chaucer onwards, and without even getting up from this table to consult a book, I can think of passages which, if written now, would be stigmatised as anti-Semitism in the works of Shakespeare, Smollett, Thackeray, Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells, T.S. Eliot, Aldous Huxley, and various others. Offhand, the only English writers I can think of who, before the days of Hitler, made a definite effort to stick up for Jews, are Dickens and Charles Reed. And however little the average intellectual may have agreed with the opinions of Belloc and Chesterton, he did not acutely disapprove of them. Chesterton's endless tirades against Jews, which he thrust into stories and essays upon the flimsiest pretexts, never got him into trouble. Indeed, Chesterton was one of the most generally respected figures in English literary life. Anyone who wrote in that strain now would bring down a storm of abuse upon himself, or, more probably, would find it impossible to get his writings published. If, as I suggest, 
Prejudice against Jews has always been pretty widespread in England. There is no reason to think that Hitler has genuinely diminished it. He has merely caused a sharp division between the politically conscious person who realizes that this is not a time to throw stones at the Jews, and the unconscious person whose native anti-Semitism is increased by the nervous strain of the war. One can assume, therefore, that many people who would perish rather than admit to anti-Semitic feelings are secretly prone to them. I have already indicated that I believe anti-Semitism to be essentially a neurosis. But of course, it has its rationalizations, which are sincerely believed in and are partly true. The rationalization put forward by the common man is that the Jew is an exploiter. The partial justification for this is that the Jew in England is generally a small businessman. That is to say, a person whose depredations are more obvious and intelligible than those of, say, a bank or an insurance company. Higher up the intellectual scale, anti-Semitism is rationalized by saying that the Jew is a person who spreads disaffection and weakens national morale. Again, there is some superficial justification for this. During the past 25 years, the activities of what are called intellectuals have been largely mischievous. I do not think it an exaggeration to say that if the intellectuals had done their work a little more thoroughly, Britain would have surrendered in 1940. But the disaffected intelligentsia inevitably included a large number of Jews. With some plausibility, it can be said that the Jews are the enemies of our native culture and our national morale. Carefully examined, the claim is seen to be nonsense, but there are always a few prominent individuals who can be cited to support it. During the past few years, there has been what amounts to a counterattack against the rather shallow leftism which was fashionable in the previous decade and which was exemplified by such organizations as the Left Book Club. This counterattack, see for instance such books as Arnold Lund's The Good Gorilla or Evelyn Waugh's Put Out More Flags, has an anti-Semitic strain, and it would probably be more marked if the subject were not so obviously dangerous. It so happens that for some decades past, Britain has had no nationalist intelligentsia worth bothering about. But British nationalism, i.e. nationalism of an intellectual kind, may revive, and probably will revive if Britain comes out of the present war greatly weakened. The young intellectuals of 1950 may be as naively patriotic as those of 1914. In that case, the kind of anti-Semitism which flourished among the anti-Dreyfusards in France and which Chesterton and Belloc tried to import into this country, might get a foothold. I have no hard and fast theory about the origins of anti-Semitism. The two current explanations, that it is due to economic causes, or on the other hand, that it is a legacy from the Middle Ages, seem to me unsatisfactory, though I admit that if one combines them, they can be made to cover the fact. All I would say with confidence is that anti-Semitism is part of the larger problem of nationalism, which has not yet been seriously examined, and that the Jew is evidently a scapegoat. Though for what he is a scapegoat, we do not yet know. In this essay, I have relied almost entirely on my own limited experience, and perhaps every one of my conclusions would be negatived by other observers. The fact is that there are almost no data on this subject, but for what they are worth, I will summarize my opinions. Boiled down, they amount to this. There is more anti-Semitism in England than we care to admit, and the war has accentuated it, but it is not certain that it is on the increase if one thinks in terms of decades rather than years. It does not at present lead to open persecution, but it has the effect of making people callous to the sufferings of Jews in other countries. It is, at bottom, quite irrational, and will not yield to argument. The persecutions in Germany have caused much concealment of anti-Semitic feeling, and thus obscured the whole picture. The subject need serious investigation. Only the last point is worth expanding. To study any subject scientifically, one needs a detached attitude, which is obviously harder when one's own interests or emotions are involved. Plenty of people who are quite capable of being objective about sea urchins, say, or the square root of two, become schizophrenic if they have to think about the sources of their own income. What vitiates nearly all that is written about anti-Semitism is the assumption in the writer's mind that he himself is immune to it. Since I know that anti-Semitism is irrational, he argues, it follows that I do not share it. He thus fails to start his investigation in the one place where he could get hold of some reliable evidence, that is, in his own mind. It seems to me a safe assumption that the disease loosely called nationalism is now almost universal. Anti-Semitism is only one manifestation of nationalism, and not everyone will have the disease in that particular form. A Jew, for example, would not be anti-Semitic, 
but then many Zionist Jews seem to me to be merely anti-Semites turned upside down, just as many Indians and Negroes display the normal color prejudices in an inverted form. The point is that something, some psychological vitamin, is lacking in modern civilization. And as a result, we are all more or less subject to this lunacy of believing that whole races or nations are mysteriously good or mysteriously evil. I defy any modern intellectual to look closely and honestly into his own mind without coming upon nationalistic loyalties and hatreds of one kind or another. It is the fact that he can feel the emotional tug of such things, and yet see them dispassionately for what they are, that gives him his status as an intellectual. It will be seen, therefore, that the starting point for any investigation of anti-Semitism should not be why does this obviously irrational belief appeal to other people, but why does anti-Semitism appeal to me? What is there about it that I feel to be true? If one asks this question, one at least discovers one's own rationalizations, and it may be possible to find out what lies beneath them. Anti-Semitism should be investigated, and I will not say by anti-Semites, but at any rate by people who know that they are not immune to that kind of emotion. When Hitler has disappeared, a real inquiry into the subject will be possible, and it would probably be best to start not by debunking anti-Semitism, but by marshalling all the justifications for it that can be found, in one's own mind or anybody else's. In that way, one might get some clues that would lead to its psychological roots. But that anti-Semitism will be definitively cured without curing the larger disease of nationalism, I do not believe.